So good evening, everyone. I hope you're all safe, enjoying your holidays. Thank you for tuning in for today's lecture, which is part of the Wednesday webinars series. We're very happy to have you. My name is Dan Renem. I'm a board member here at LAMSA. I'm a dedicated student athlete and a third year medical student at the American University of Beirut. I hold a BA in psychology and a minor in biology. Today, I'll be giving you a brief overview about obsessive compulsive disorder. So before we start, kindly make sure your microphones are muted. All throughout the session, feel free to type in questions or concerns in the chat box. Thank you. So I'll start with a clinical case uh, and we'll start as soon as possible and try to keep it brief. Something patients with OCD will not always be able to do. And why is that? Because uh, had I still been checking the door, trying to see whether I locked it or not, I probably would have taken about 30 minutes and will not have made it on time for this meeting. So this is the case of Eaton, a 15 year old boy who is um, continually distracted by powerful and peculiar thoughts, such as counting how many times he blinks and how many steps it takes to get to the kitchen. Sounds a lot like hopscotch when we were kids. Sounds like fun. However, he avoids stepping on any floor tiles with dirt on them because he doesn't want to get germs on his feet. He is obsessed with germs on door handles and feels compelled to avoid touching them unless he first uses a cloth, which he always has with him to clean the handle off. So it's a bit excessive and maybe even irrational for a kid. So what happens if he doesn't have the cloth? On those rare occasions that he misplaces or forgets to bring a clean cloth with him, he gets extremely anxious freezes and feels sick to his stomach. So the history is paramount. Ethan has an obsessive compulsive disorder, a severe and disabling clinical condition of ritual and doubt. So he had a specific distraction. He wanted to avoid it. Uh, he, used, he used a neutralizing method, which was used to relieve the anxiety but the anxiety was so strong that he had to engage in the neutralization and, and so on and so forth. We'll talk about this further. So some people think that people with OCD love to clean, for example, labeling them as hygiene obsessed. Hand washing in OCD is done in utter misery. So not through a love of cleaning as they have to carry it out in response to distressing thoughts and feelings which are anxiety provoking. So OCD is a common disorder associated with significant disability and chronicity. So unlike anxiety disorders, in OCD, the anxiety provoking event is a thought, an image, an impulse, so notably obsessions, but you may also have just rigid rules that you need these are intrusive and unwanted, so the individual attempts to avoid them. So how do they do that? Is they attempt to ignore, suppress, or even neutralize with some other thought or action, in other words, compulsions. So what do we mean by that? As per the DSM-5, in order for one to be diagnosed with OCD, one has to have either obsessions or compulsions or both. Obsessions are defined by recurrent and persistent thoughts, urges, or images that are experienced over and over again. So it's important for us to have the recurrent factor here. At some time during the disturbance, uh, as intrusive and unwanted. So you get to feel the distress and the marking anxiety that is being caused to the individual. And second, the individual will attempt to ignore or suppress those thoughts, urges, or images, or even to neutralize them with some other thought of, or action. And this is where we talk about performing a compulsion. 
So recent research shows that the symptoms flow a few broad themes. Within these themes, obsessions can take a countless numbers of forms. So it could be related to contamination, which is the one people know most of. Um, it's basically about the fear of germs, dirtiness, chemicals, AIDS. You have the symmetry or exactness. So some people have to have their belongings put in a specific way, uh, one centimeter away from that edge in that specific corner. So it's really distressing and debilitating. And sometimes they can even take up to 30 minutes trying to get this in the right specific spot. Doubting, so whether the appliance is turned off, so did I heat the oven, did I turn off the oven after heating my food? Uh, is the door locked right now? Aggressive impulses, so thoughts of stabbing one's children. Accidental, accidental harm to others, fears of being responsible for a fire. So related to the uh, doubting that you have, so did I turn off the oven? If not, uh, will I be responsible for the upcoming fire? So there's a constant worrying that happened and it's very much recurrent. It can also be related to religion. So having sexual thoughts about a holy figure or even have some other miscellaneous obsessions such as um, people having such lucky numbers, unlucky colors, uh, the need to know some trivia details such as memorizing house numbers, license plates and so on. So you have compulsions and compulsions are defined as repetitive behaviors, such as hand washing, placing the things in a specific order, etc. So these happen in response to an obsession and they're usually related to this. We'll see a few examples in due time. Or according to rules that must be applied so rigidly in an exact manner to make the obsession go away. So unless I do it exactly that way, I will not be relieved of my anxiety. The behaviors or mental acts are aimed at preventing or reducing the anxiety or the distress or preventing some dreaded event or situation. So maybe if I jump those two, three tiles and not four, then this event will not happen. However, these behaviors or mental acts are not necessarily connected in a realist realistic way with what they are designed to neutralize. So basically what we mean by this is that, is that most of the time they are excessive and extreme. Like obsessions, compulsions can take many forms, which can include the following. So washing and cleaning, excessive showering, hand washing, house cleaning, excessive checking, excessive counting, repeating actions or thoughts, the need to ask or confess, so as you can see, these are actually related to the obsessions because usually they come in as relieving uh, actions to those obsessions. Also, we have hoarding, so keeping magazines, flyers, clothing, information. So you keep these without a specific rationale behind it. You just think that you necessarily have to because otherwise something might happen ordering and arranging, so the need for things to be straight, sequenced, or in a certain order, repeating words or phrases or prayers to oneself. So these are thought to be as safe words or safe prayers. So if I ever feel in danger, all I need to do is repeat that specific word. It's my safe word. Uh, we consider these normal at first, and that is how it should be, because we should not fall into the trap of over-diagnosing. So sometimes these, and personally, I love to shower, but if I don't shower twice a day, I mean, it's fine. I can still go on with my life. So it's not debilitating. Uh, if I have a meeting and I already showered in the morning, I don't have to shower in the evening again to the point where it will make me late for my meeting. So as long as it's not interfering with your daily functioning, it's fine if it's just a preference. But when it takes hours to do and represent an impairment or dysfunction, this is when it becomes abnormal. So if we go back to the diagnostic criteria put by the DSM-5, we covered the presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both. Uh, B, V, obsession or compulsions are time consuming, so they take more than one hour per day or cause significant 
uh, distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. The obsessive compulsive symptoms are not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance, so drug of abuse, medication, or another medical condition. And the disturbances is not better explained by the symptoms of another mental disorder, such as generalized anxiety disorder, body dysmorphic disorder, hoarding disorder, etc. It's also important to know that we have specifiers. So more often than not, obsessions are recognized at some point as excessive or unreasonable. Um, most of the time, people will come and tell you, well, I do this stupid thing where I count the tiles. So they use the word stupid, dumb, or silly. Yet even then, OCD is very resistant to reason, and that is why it's hard to treat. So you need to specify whether they have insight or not. So whether they recognize that their OCD beliefs are not true or that they may or may not be true. So then they have good or fair insight. Poor insight would be OCD beliefs are probably true. And absent insight or delusional beliefs would be the individual is completely convinced that obsessive compulsive disorder beliefs are true. We also need to specify if it's tick related. So if the individual has a current or past history of a tick disorder. Not all recurrent thoughts or repetitive behaviors are OCD. So we have common non OCD obsessions or compulsions. Uh, some people are obsessed with movie stars, with high performance cars, with the need to succeed, with getting high grades. And some people just feel compelled to partake in gambling, overeating, engage in sexual activity. So this is not OCD. And uh, the distinction really depends on multiple factors. And a nice way of categorizing it is looking at those uh, six subtypes that I put here. So looking at the frequency. So how often do they do it? What is it about it exactly? So the contact, the emotional impact. So does it really affect them, uh, debilitating for them or not? How distressing is it? The consequences. So uh, are people without OCD able to forget? something? Yes, but people without OCD are unable to forget about the passing mental intrusions. And what happens if they don't do the compulsion? So if they don't partake in this action, will something happen? If yes, what is it and how debilitating is it? Cognitive appraisal, control strategies. So does it require motor action or visual concentration? Can I control it? Can I dismiss it? So these are very important things to keep in mind. And a nice way is basically memorizing that you need your four Ds. And I like to add to this the fifth one. So uh, as a psychology major, they used to tell us, know your four Ds. Deviance, so deviating from the norm. Um, dysfunction, so the problem being impairing the daily functioning. Distress. So uh, being debilitating to the person, danger, whether it's a danger to oneself or to someone else. And the fifth one that I like to add is the duration. So how debilitating is it? Um, so here are a few examples about when we have OCD and when we don't have OCD. So if I could get a volunteer to read what is OCD and what's not OCD. So, uh, Maybe Irana, if you can read the first one, please. Hi, Jan. Are you talking about Rana? <laughs> My wow, sister. hi, Tada. You can read as well. Yes, okay, I'll read it. So, a man who washes his hands a hundred times a day until they are red and raw. Awesome. And non OCD would be? A woman who unfailingly washes her hands before every meal. Awesome. So it's pretty clear. Um, Christian, can you read the second one? Yes. A woman who locks and relocks her door before, before going to work every day for half an hour is, uh, suffers from OCD. 
Not OCD, a woman who double checks that her apartment door and windows are locked each night before she goes to bed. Awesome. Um, Serena, can you read the third one? Hi. Okay, Hi. OCD, a college student who must step on the door frame of every classroom 14 times before entering. And not OCD, a musician who practices a difficult passage over and over again until it's perfect. Amazing. Roland, can you read the last one? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. So a man, a man who stores 19 years of newspaper just in case with no system for filling or retrieving versus a, a woman who dedicates all her spare time and money to building her record collect collection. Awesome. So thank you guys. Um, I think now it's pretty clear what's OCD and what isn't. So OCD type obsessions and compulsions are never the least bit pleasurable. So as you can see, the guy has red and raw hands. They're cracked from washing, so it's not really pleasant. They have a hard time functioning and they're stuck in a loop. And here's why. So basically they have those obsessions, those unwanted distressing thoughts. And these provoke some anxiety. And then they feel that severe urge to relieve that anxiety. And then the anxiety um, for it to be relieved need to, needs uh, to go away by them engaging in a specific behavior. So by engaging in a compulsion, the compulsion will indeed um, provoke a bit of relief to that person. However, the relief will only be temporary. And since the obsession will come and since the compulsions have already worked previously, the people have already been negatively reinforced to engage in their compulsion again. So in a nutshell, it was an anxiety provoking event. You used something to relieve the anxiety. It worked. You're obviously going to use the same method again, and then it will go on and on. Forever. So this is a very hard cycle to break because as we said, even if they have insight, it's resistant to reason. Um, how do you diagnose OCD? So the assessment is mostly clinical. You will know whether the patient has OCD based on everything that we've seen so far. Um, however, you have a few assessment tools and these usually uh, are used to assess the severity. The most commonly used one is the Y box. It's a 10 item clinically administered scale that has become the most widely used rating scale for OCD. It consists of 10 items, as you can see on this slide. It includes five items for obsessions and five for compulsions, each of which is scored from zero to four with a total score reaching to 40. So the Y box is designed to rate the symptom severity and not to establish diagnosis. So why is OCD important? How often does it happen? Whom does it affect? So basically it happens to 0.32% of the pediatric population and 2.5 to 3.5% of the adult population. In childhood, it mostly affects males. In adulthood, mainly females, though it's pretty much the same. The age of onset, is a bit earlier in males and slightly later in females. I personally think, and based on the um, literature that I've read about this topic, that these are actually with a little grain of salt because need to be taken with a bit of grain of salt because what happens is that at a young age, not that girls do not have OCD. It's just that girls who have OCD traits at such a young age are not really diagnosed with OCD because it's cultural to see that the girl is neat and that she likes to be clean and neat and washes her hands frequently. So what happens is there's a bit of a delay in the diagnosis and it's not really the onset of the disease itself. So this is something that we need to keep in mind. Uh, we also have lots of comorbidities. So up to 76% of people with OCD also had another anxiety disorder, such as panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, specific phobia, 
63% had a mood disorder. The most um, common one was a major depressive disorder with up to 40%. And um, it's very much comorbid with OCPD, so obsessive compulsive personality disorder, and up to 29% patients had a tick disorder, most commonly males who had a childhood onset. So why do people develop OCD and others don't? So correlation is multifactorial. It's very important to keep in mind that we have psychological factors, environmental factors, and neurobiology and genetic factors. So concerning the psychological factors, it's very simple. We have the temperament and trait theory, which basically means that some people just have a specific temperament with higher negative emotionality and behavioral inhibition. So they'll be more likely to develop OCD. We have the psychoanalytic theory, which is linked to Freud's stages of development and more specifically the anal stage. So developmentally linked to toilet training. What happens is the kid is um, frustrated from the very stringent and severe uh, meticulous way of having to um, poop or to engage in toilet training. So they really have aggressive impulses that they want to express, but they can't because then they'll be sanctioned by their parents for it. So they repress the aggression and these repressed impulses become displaced and substituted by less unacceptable impulses. Uh, we have the behavioral theory. So John B. Watson, Skinner, Pavlov, we've heard of these. And this is the theory that people follow now and it's the process of classical conditioning. So there's the cue that elicits an anxiety provoking obsession. So a compulsive behavior is done to relieve this anxiety and then uh, it has been negatively reinforced as we've seen previously. There's also the appraisal of cues where the interpretation of the cue as being dangerous or anxiety inducing and the interpretation of the compulsion as being the safety escape. Environmental, so environmental factors is basically the family system hypothesis. So the socialization and the family environment has made those people vulnerable to develop obsessions and compulsions. Physical and sexual abuse in childhood or even illnesses during childhood, such as a group A streptococcal infection. And this will damage the basal ganglia, which takes us to the neurobiology. So neurobiology and genetics. So genetics, no specific gene has been identified yet. However, they have found that there is a mutation in the human serotonin transporter gene. Apart from that, there's the neurotransmission hypothesis. So there's a dysregulation of serotonin and other neurotransmitters. And this slide covers the Cortico-basal ganglia thalamocortical hypothesis. Let's keep it simple. Follow this uh, graph. What it says is that we have ve four very important parts. The orbitofrontal cortex, which is usually uh, mainly used for uh, information processing, making the decisions, will not be able to make decent decision. Rather, it will detect an error when in fact there isn't any and it will send the worrying signals. This will be interpreted uh, in the cingulate gyrus, where you have the emotional aspect uh, that is put in. And whenever you fail to filter these, they go to the caudate nucleus. There is no filtering whatsoever. And in the basal ganglia, which is usually uh, responsible for controlling movement and thinking, you will just have the reflexive repetitive behaviors. So the compulsions. Uh, this is as simple as it can get in terms of uh, neuro, but also it's nice to see it again on the PET scan. So in the frontal lobe, there's an increased activity and frontal lobe is basically this one where you basically have the obsessions and in the basal ganglia, you also have increased activity, which is basically the compulsions usually. So we have very much elevated brain activity and high energy expenditure. How do we manage? So if the symptoms are not very severe, 
we start with cognitive behavioral therapy, not medication. So it's very important to first target the thoughts, the cognitive aspect using CBT, systemic desensitization, flooding if needed, though not always encouraged. Give the patient two, three months trial, so don't just move on to medications. After a two, three months trial, if these don't work, go to the SSRIs. These are the most efficient. Otherwise, go to TCA, tricyclic amino acids, um, such as clomipramine. It's the one that actually works, and it's even better than SSRIs. However, you cannot use it over a long period of time. So what happens is people usually use shift back to SSRIs because on the long run, the side effect of clomipramine is very bad, especially for weight gain. Usually, most doctors uh, prescribe a combination of drug and behavioral therapy. What happens if the patient still isn't responding very well? So, you reassess your diagnosis. It's probable that you might have missed something, or maybe you misdiagnosed your patient. So, reassess. Second, neuroleptic augmentation. Third, address the comorbid conditions that you have found. How do we address them? If he turned out to be anxious, treat the anxiety, the spirone, benzodiazepines. Happens to be depressed, treat the depression with lithium. Happens to have tics or psychosis, use an antipsychotic. What happens if still not responding? Check if the patient is suicidal. If the patient is suicidal, use electroconvulsive therapy. Still hard to treat, still resistant, consider psychosurgery. Uh, CBT is indicated with all of the above mentioned steps. Medication will still be needed after surgery. So I know it's the end of the day, but if you've ever said, I'm just a little bit OCD, then this quiz is for you, just to make sure we're on the same page before I leave you. So um, I'm gonna ask you a few questions and kindly type in the chat box your answers. It's an MCQ thing. Let's play. Here we go. So all of the following are true about people with OCD, except people with OCD are picky. They have no control over their thoughts. They have significant distress. Their obsessions are not pleasurable. So what's your answer? Ahmad, Sarah, Celine, Alex, good job, guys. <laughs> Next question. Bravo, guys. Okay. So which of the following can help distinguish between OCD and non-OCD obsessions and compulsions? Increased arousal, emotional impact, decreased concentration, increased activity. Take your time. <laughs> no one's going to take anything, guys. You're getting this one wrong. Think again. Which of the following can help distinguish between the two, OCD and non-OCD? So, Stephanie, Celine, Nada, good job. Rashad, Eli, Sylvia, Mario, okay. So it's emotionally impact. You have increased activity in both. It's not whether you're still active or not. It's about how debilitating and how distressing it is going to be for the patient. So what is the estimated prevalence of OCD, OCPD comorbidity? So this one was in the table. Ahmad, Ali, good job. Mm. 
Bravo, guys. Okay, what is the... Okay, what is the difference between a tick and a compulsion? Ticks are involuntary. Compulsions are voluntary. OCD compulsion is rooted in anxiety. All of the above. Christian, George, Felice, Amir, Alex, good job. Okay, two well, more. Let's play. Here we go. So what is the difference between OCD and OCPD? OCD is ego dystonic. OCPD is ego dystonic. OCPD helps in completing daily tasks. OCPD is nice. Okay, and let me explain ego dystonic for people who don't know. Basically, it means whether it's in line or not with uh, people's regular thinking and behavior. So whether they're okay with it happening or not, if it's not in line with their values or whatever. Job, Samir. So which one's ego dystonic? CPD. Bravo, Mario. Okay, so OCD, they have to do it. They're not convinced. It's not that they're, they prefer doing it. It's A. OCPD is ego syntonic. Okay, so it's in sync with what they believe. Last one. OCD can be successfully treated with CBT, ECT, clomipramine, fluoxetine. Yeah. Sara, Rashad, Nada. You just won one million. <laughs> okay, good job, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. I was very happy to have you. Um, please feel free to write your questions in the chat box and I'd be very happy to answer them. Hi, John. Hi. Quick question. Um, do you have any idea if the COVID pandemic increases the case of OCD, like people with washing their hands and sanitizing their hands constantly? Do you have any, do you have any idea if that this have an, had an impact on, on the patients or, or, or people in general? I think it's a very nice question in a sense that it's very much of actual um, news. Uh, however, I think that based on the risk factors that we have, it's something that either you are predisposed to develop or you're not. Now, it's important to know that OCD doesn't really, um, is not really limited to hand washing and uh, contamination and cleaning processes. It's a lot more than that. So some people might maybe engage more in this, but I think it's very important to take contacts in consideration and people who end up engaging in more um, hand washing than other people shouldn't be labeled as uh, having OCD in that sense because it's within the context. So it's something that is kind of normalized now. So it's not abnormal and we shouldn't go into the trap of overdiagnosing. Uh, will it increase the prevalence later on? Uh, possibly, I don't know. I think we have to wait and see whether um, COVID is going to decline and the hand washing is going to keep going, but I doubt it. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. In the case of aggressive, intrusive thoughts, what can be the compulsions? So, it could be related, but it can also be uh, not related to anything. So, basically, a very individualized and personal process. Uh, I have aggressive and intrusive thought, and um, the only way for me to 
uh, relieve my anxiety of these thoughts is to, I don't know, maybe go into sublimation and gift those people that I'm thinking of harming um, gifts, you know, this is relieving for me, then this is my compulsion. This is an example, but it's a very individual case by case situation. So to each his compulsions. Thank you for your question, Ahmed. Okay, um, Zena, what about ketamine for comorbidity, depression, suicidal thoughts of OCD? Is there any contraindications? So I haven't read much about ketamine specifically, but what happened is that um, mainly they noticed that SSRIs work better than anxiety uh, relieving medication just because there's the serotonin and dopamine um, imbalance. So it could work as an antidepressant and lots of, um, lots of uh, research has shown that it could work, but um, research about OCD specifically has focused on SSRI specifically. So I think it's a bit further away to add ketamine to that list as well. Aren't people with poor insight sometimes mistaken to be psychotic? Um, not really, and that's where you need the specifier. What happens is if they do fit criteria for psychosis, and you will know because they will either have delusions, either paranoia, either um, ideas of grandiosity, jealousy, etc. So they will be categorized as psychotic. Um, if they have poor insight, it's specifically related to the definition. They believe their OCD beliefs are true, are not true, are possibly true, and that's it. And we would just specify it as being uh, poor, fair, etc. So the slide was here. So good or fair, poor, absent, or delusional beliefs, but it's always related to the OCD itself. Okay, I hope I answered your question, um, Sarah. Christian, is exposure therapy helpful? Absolutely, because exposure therapy goes within um, behavioral therapy, so it's a subtype. And basically, when people go into cognitive behavioral therapy, there are many uh, ways that people use. It depends on the psychologist and the psychiatrist and the patient. So what they agree on as what works best for them and uh, which method they want to engage with. If they decide to go for exposure therapy, it goes both ways. It can either be a desensitization where they start by uh, slowly having uh, exposing the patient to their fear or their obsession uh, and then inc increasing over time. And if they decide to just go for flooding, it's not a gradual process and they're just flooded with their obsession at once. So that's about exposure therapy. So it is helpful, it depends on the people. Any more questions? Thank you all guys, thank you for tuning in. I'm happy to read your comments. Awesome, so I think uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I know it's been a long day. Merry Christmas again to everyone. Enjoy your New Year's with your family. I hope you're all uh, safe and sound and uh, don't over party and overcrowd your evenings. Thanks again and we'll see you in the next session. Take care.